This late 90s stereo set is one of the most unusual I've ever seen. Made by Duel, or was it? It is 1998. Most compact hi-fi systems looked quite much alike. Often with many, sometimes illuminated tip buttons and light blue VFD displays. That's when I cut out this advertisement from Dutch mail order magazine Neckerman. You know, before internet shopping was a thing. It's the dual MN8010G. They also made a GA version with big speakers resting on their own amplifier. At the same time, in the same style, they also released a TV, video recorder and even a computer. Neckermann was owned by German department store Kastad and they sold these products exclusively. I'll explain how that happened in the following boring chapter you should skip. Most of you will not know the brand Dual or Dual at all. They were and are a praised turntable manufacturer. The name is derived from their successful dual motor system for record players, introduced in 1927. The timeless logo has been on their devices since around the early 60s, when the company was ever growing and began to offer complete hi-fi solutions. Unfortunately, in 1982, Dual went bankrupt. Like many companies, they could not compete with the Far East. Dual was taken over by French company Thompson, and in 1998 they sold it to German company Schneider. After another restructure around 1995, the Dual brand was split where Schneider kept making Dual turntables and Karstadt got the rights to make Dual branded Hi-Fi. After some development time they registered the brand in 1998 and released a small but ambitious product line of which official photos seem to be extinct. Dual products by Karstadt can easily be recognized because they changed the iconic logo to this. It looks like they made only one other hi-fi tower before stopping with Dual again. Today the brand Dual is licensed by three different companies. Among them the turntable maker in the original German factory. Right, the MN8010. So rare and unknown that for the few sales that did show up, I was the only one interested. Actually, I bought three of these just to make this video. Because the first one was delivered wrongly, and on the second one, a turning knob stopped working. The upside of that is that I can now show you both available colors. Graphite and something I would describe as polar ice turquoise. A color so subtle that on most photos, including this official photo, it looks gray. But when comparing it with something that's actually silver, you can see it better. The blades on the side seem to glow when light is coming from above. I wonder if this was a happy accident. Though at the time I had mixed feelings about its distinct design, the removable graphical user interface was certainly something never seen before. This NAD remote from the same era is the closest comparison. It was made in Portugal by Grundig, based on their Fine Arts series. But the control unit would have been made by a different company which I cannot confirm, perhaps because that company doesn't want to be reminded of it. Dual claimed it was the first hi-fi system with a graphical user interface, which was their main selling point. Everything is controlled with this interface. Any guess on how to turn it on? Incorrect. You've just cut the power and have to reset the clock. The two turning knobs can be pressed and by pressing the left knob, you turn it on. When powering up, it remembered the last input and starts playing. It also does that when you switch from input. An interesting decision. 
besides the power cut button, there's an open close button for the cassette deck and one for the three disc changer. All the rest is done using the big party trick, the removable control unit. Now take a guess on how to remove it. Sci-fi hi-fi. The remaining giant hole is not that charming, unfortunately. In the past 30 years, remotes have hardly changed. This one is from 2019. This one, 2016. 2002. 1996. 1992. Yeah. And this one, well, timeless, I guess. At first, I didn't realize you shouldn't place it like this. But like this, even though the manual doesn't mention that. The control unit knows nothing and receives all information every half second. Via infrared, so it must be in line of sight. In this experiment, the remote switches between the two sets, including the on and off state. The control unit sends infrared commands just like a normal remote. Now, the battery in the control unit is one of a kind, literally. There is no battery indicator and no info on the running time. All the manual says is that when switched off completely with the unit attached, the battery will be empty in about 8 hours. Even though you can easily access the battery, there is absolutely zero information about the battery. The battery lasted for only a few years and eventually would get rather hot because it got overcharged. So the owners removed the battery and left the unit in. And with that, the only clue about a replacement is gone. I opened it up to see if there might be some clue inside, but no. All we find here is an amazing amount of circuitry, which must be very power hungry. In the end, I found a local electro wizard who managed to make a fitting battery pack. Even these new batteries drain in less than a day. Maybe that is why they didn't use smaller rechargeable AA batteries. Enough about that. One other problem is that without the control unit, the system is unusable. So you better not <laughs> drop it. It might be clear by now why this system is a unicorn. But let's demonstrate its big selling point, the graphical user interface. By turning the left knob, you change the volume, which happens rather slow. There is no mute button, so if something is unexpectedly loud, you'll just have to dial the knob down. But these few minor drawbacks are okay, I guess, for a tech novelty like this. The right knob is used to change values. If you press it, you go back a level until you're at the home screen. And how do you turn it off? By pressing and holding the right knob. Let's put the blue unit in the graphite set for a fully functional system. I'll give a brief overview of the user interface. You can change the language between English and German. But let's begin with the amplifier section. You can set the bass and treble with a nice visible representation. The balance has a double visualization. 
you may notice the moving patterns here. This has nothing to do with camera artifacts, but is actually happening on the display. This is the dithering used to display grayscales. It seems to use a repeating pattern instead of random noise. In slow motion you can see the colorful pulsing of the CCFL backlight. But I'm getting off topic here, sorry. The tone function and loudness function change the sound like an equalizer preset. The tuner is also quite cool. It gives an analog style display of where the stations are in the spectrum. Or you can choose the list view. Then the 3 CD changer. Skipping a track is quite complex. First press track, then rotate the dial, and then you have to press track again. Changing disc though happens with one press. By pressing more, you go to the second menu. There are some rather extensive functions here, and you can press record. That's how you can record to the cassette deck. This works the same for other inputs. The level meters are quite useless because they only update every half second. Let's go to the cassette deck. The CD stops and the cassette starts. The title function searches for a silence and continues playing there. The three play modes must be selected with the dial, but you switch between the three noise reduction modes by just pressing the button. If you had other dual or perhaps Grundig devices, you could also use the unit for that. In this case, it serves as a regular remote. This adds quite some value to the graphical user interface, as long as the battery hasn't drained, that is. And then the system settings. There is a very complex timer and you can enable or disable the dual speaker outputs. On the second page you can set the clock in case someone pressed power by accident and some lost tuner options. And the tuner has been searching all this time because there's no antenna connected. And on page 2 we find brightness and contrast for the display. Overall, you could state that this user interface is not very convenient compared to regular buttons. It reminds me of modern cars actually, with their flawed, buggy computer interfaces. So this stereo set really was way ahead of its time maybe a realized dream of one of the staff members at Kastad. This is Steam. More about that should be in the next video, because after all, this channel is about everything and nothing. Anyway, another piece of forgotten history virtually preserved. Thanks for watching and I hope to see you soon. The video is over, you can stop watching.